Hi everyone, I'm Gwenda from the Fertility Network team. Thanks for joining us for our webinar about IVF add-ons. I would like to thank our partners Bearings who helped us organise this webinar and also to Mr Stuart Lavery, a consultant gynaecologist at the Hammersmith Hospital and a senior lecturer at Imperial College in London who will be giving the presentation today. I will be here but in the background and I'll come back at the end and if we have time we can ask any questions which have been dropped in the Q&A box. So if you're ready Stuart, I will pass over to you. Brenda, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's a real thrill for me to be here and give this presentation uh, to the Fertility Network. Um, and I very much hope that over, over the next 30 to 45 minutes, we're going to be able to discuss what is a relatively controversial topic. You will speak to different doctors and find different opinions about some of these procedures that we're going to discuss. And it's not unusual for patients to find themselves in a really difficult position uh, of trying to figure out what is going to work for them. So I'm just going to spend a moment and share my screen. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is, is really, uh, over the next 30 to 45 minutes, try and present as even-handed, fair, up-to-date, and evidence-based discussion about what is a heated, controversial, sometimes emotional topic. So I'm going to mention a few of the more commonly known add-ons, and I'm going to talk about their chance of success. This is going to be the structure of the talk. We'll say a few words of introduction. Try and define what is an add-on because it changes over time. There are certain treatments now that are well accepted and a significant solid part of assisted conception treatment that 10 years ago were add-ons. I want to discuss why do clinics offer add-ons because clinics often come in for quite a lot of criticism for having these uh, add-ons advertised on their websites. And then I wanna try and explore with you why do patients choose add-ons? And then finally, drill down beneath the emotion, beneath um, the vulnerability, and try and say, is there any evidence to help us make those decisions? I'm gonna talk about something called the cheeseburger effect. The cheeseburgers are not add-ons, but I'm gonna say a little bit more about what I mean later. And then finally, I'm going to finish off with what does it all mean? Where do we go from here? How can we navigate uh, this area? Um, by way of introduction, I mean, I, I really don't need to say anything to this audience about couples or individuals going through fertility treatment. The stakes are high. Um, when treatment succeeds, <laughs> yeah, the right. investment um, <laughs> in, uh, and having a family and having a child yeah, and bring immeasurable improvement to the of life. Um, but when the treatment fails, it's painful and those stakes can rise even higher. And there becomes a pressure both on doctors and on patients to do something extra. And it's really that pressure to try and help, to try and improve the expectation of success that's actually given rise to the whole field of add-ons. So, if you're sitting there with your doctor or with your fertility nurse after a failed cycle, one of the main things that you will want to ask is, is really strategically, which way do we go here? Do we need to try something new? or should we stay calm and should we just carry on? And I would suggest that most doctors and most patients feel the desire to try something new rather than the strategy of keep calm and let's just have another attempt. So what is a treatment add-on? Well, really it's something that is not a routine part of IVF and something that is not offered routinely 
to IVF patients. So it's a treatment or a procedure that sits outside. And there are good reasons for that. And the main reason is that these treatments are normally not supported by robust evidence. Now, patients understandably will want any treatment they receive to work and proof that it works. So to demand evidence that your treatment is effective is, is not unreasonable. And so therefore for us to consider treatments that don't have a robust evidence base, it means a lot more decision making. It means a lot more going on trust as opposed to going on hard evidence. Most clinics these days when they are offering private cycles do so within a package so that patients are not anxious. Do I need an extra blood test? Do I need an extra scan? I'll have to pay for that. So most of the evidence-based treatments are put together in one package cost. And most patients find that quite a reassuring financial move. But because these treatment add-ons don't have an evidence base and don't form part of the normal package, they are usually billed separately. Some people have suggested that why don't we just put everything in one treatment package and split the cost? And then a patient can just be recommended what they need. And the concern with that approach is that the financial cost of some of these add-ons, if they were added to patients paying for treatment who didn't use them, then their cost of their IVF would go up unnecessarily. So that's the reason why most clinics bill them outside of the package cost. It's unusual that add-ons are discussed with people when they come through the door for the first time or when their first treatment cycle is being designed. Add-ons are normally things that come up in conversation when that initial evidence-based approach has not been successful. And both patient and doctor are feeling that pressure to try and do something new. And as I said earlier, this, this changes over time. Unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember when freezing embryos was an add-on. Um, there was no real evidence that freezing embryos was helpful uh, and that the NHS at the time wouldn't pay for people uh, freezing embryos. And so patients had to pay a bolt-on add-on price for freezing their embryos. Now, fortunately, times have changed, evidence has built up, and freezing embryos has now become a routine evidence-based practice. So this world of add-ons is dynamic. Things will come into the add-on category and they will move out of the add-on category, either into a scenario where we know this doesn't work, let's drop it, or alternatively into something that this is a great intervention, let's consider using it for everybody and hopefully include it in the package price that clinics will be charging patients for. Okay, we need to understand with add-ons that the benefits are questionable. And because the evidence behind the procedure, the appropriateness of the treatment, and the harm or safety profile might also be questionable. So if these add-ons are being offered to you, it's not enough to know what potential benefit might they bring. You absolutely need to know, could this do me any harm? Is it really appropriate for me or for us with our history? And any of you know who have been to different clinics, there is a very much a heated debate among professionals. I personally don't think that there is anything in the field that splits doctors like a debate around add-ons. Um, and some people will be evangelically, evangelical believers in uh, add-ons. Uh, and other doctors will not even have them discussed or answer any questions you may have about add-ons because they believe they have no place in IVF treatment at all. So you are going to get a spectrum of responses depending on which clinic you go to. And of course, all that's going to do is confuse people. Dr. A is telling me I have to have this. I'm only going to get pregnant if I use this. Dr. B is telling me it's a complete waste of your time and money focus on other things. Doctor, what should I do? This has become such a concern that regulators are now involved. The HFEA has written documents of consensus 
around is there a responsible approach to the use of add-ons? Can we be practicing innovation responsibly? And what kind of ways can we help patients navigate the way through those decisions? And this sort of field is attracting the attention of regulators uh, around the world. And, and I think that's a good thing. Okay, so add-ons have been around for a while, but the recent fuss, the recent heated debate was really sparked by a BMJ article in 2016. And this was written by a group of academics from Oxford, none of whom were IVF doctors. So it's interesting to debate, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is it a good thing that they could dispassionately look at everything that we do and coldly look at the evidence? Or in fact, was it a weakness in the study because they couldn't understand the nuances or subtleties when sometimes in certain patients, certain procedures might be helpful? But nevertheless, clearly the academics in Oxford saw this as a very much a strength. And that's the reason why they deliberately did not invite any fertility doctors to be part of the study. Because they weren't fertility doctors, they found out about what add-ons were by studying the websites of all of the IVF clinics in the UK. And they found 38 different fertility interventions that they felt satisfied the criteria of, uh, of investigation. And of that 38, they classified 27 as add-ons. Now, what's fascinating for me is they actually excluded homeopathy and nutritional therapies uh, from their analysis. Uh, my gut feeling, I have lots of patients who are on homeopathy and nutrition, and I think it would have been well worthwhile the academics to actually include those two areas in the search for an evidence base and to find out whether homeopathy or nutrition might be of help to patients. But unfortunately, they were excluded from the analysis. So this is the long list of things that they analyzed. Some of these are relatively commonly performed in clinics, such as assisted hatching, thyroid antibodies, time-lapse embryology. And some of them are a little bit newer, not offered to everybody and not offered in every clinic. And for example, in this category, immune testing, the use of intralipid, sperm slow, and indeed even IMSI. Uh, they probably fit into that slightly rarer group. But there's a problem with this study. And the problem with this study is that it also included as add-ons, blastocyst transfer, surgical sperm retrieval, IUI, ICSI, embryo and egg vitrification, sperm freezing, natural cycle IVF, and IVF frozen embryo replacement cycle. And this caused a lot of consternation within doctors within the field, because for those um, procedures marked in red, IVF doctors will actually consider these to be routine and for them to have a relatively robust evidence base uh, that these things actually work. And so many people felt that the paper in the BMJ was weakened because all of these things that we do all the time, that we have a strong evidence base for, were included in the analysis. Um, so it, it's really quite a difficult thing that some necessary and essential treatments might have been wrongly categorized. So I think it's probably worth bearing that in mind when we look at the conclusions of the study. Another paper was done in Human Reproduction, which is the European Journal for Fertility, and they looked just at six issues, and these will be more familiar to you because they're more commonly offered. Embryo glue, I mean, what a great name that is. It's just got to work if it's called embryo glue, hasn't it? Um, sperm DNA fragmentation offered to a lot of times where we're concerned about is the sperm of sufficient quality to justify natural conception or IVF or ICSI. Time-lapse imaging, something that many laboratories have routinely gone for as a more effective way uh, of analyzing which embryos have the greatest chance of potential. Genetic screening of embryos to find out which embryos have the greatest chance of success. 40% of all IVF cycles in the United States now use pre-implantation genetic screening. Surely, if 40% of patients are using it, it must work. Why is it still classified as an add-on? Well, we'll come to the evidence base later. Mitochondrial DNA load is very new. This is a test pioneered again by a team in Oxford. 
where they were looking at the energy basis within the embryo. And if the energy sources were disordered with an embryo, was that a way that would help classify which embryos were the healthiest and which embryos had the best chance of success? And then finally, assisted hatching. And these were considered uh, by Joyce Harper and, and her team. So I hope that gives you a feel for some of the things that are out there. And, and, and you may have been offered alternative things as well, because of course the list of add-ons is not finite. But why do clinics do it? Okay, what is the reason for clinics putting these things on their websites and offering them to patients? I think most fertility doctors out there genuinely come from the position where they want to help their patients have the best outcome. Most doctors are in this field to help people have families and, and hopefully to help them have families as quickly as possible. And all of us have witnessed the pain and the trauma that people will experience when they go through unsuccessful treatments and have unsuccessful outcomes. So nobody underestimates that degree of pain and trauma that people can feel. And most doctors go into healthcare because they want to try and help. And therefore they believe that add-ons will help their patients. Sometimes we can get carried away with the science. And whenever there's a new piece of kit within uh, embryology, whenever there is a new laser, a new type of incubator, some clinics and some doctors rush to be innovative. And they want to be the first in London to offer this technique because they think it's good to be on top of the science and we may get more patients if, if patients think that we're innovative. And I think sometimes we have to be quite cautious with that because if you're an early adopter, you don't always get it right. And sometimes, although I think it's quite a noble ideal to be innovative, that can sometimes be at the expense of your patient's experience. So that wish to be innovative, innovative has to be balanced against care for your patient. Thirdly, there's this pressure to do something new or to do something different. And it's not really a medical or scientific issue. It's a human issue. And I think it's felt equally strongly by patients and by doctors. Doctor, we've done everything that you said for this cycle and we failed. We like you, we want to stay with you and with your clinic, but we've got to do something different. In brackets, in the hope that it will give us a better outcome, close brackets. And I believe it's that pressure to try something new that's pushed the field of add-ons. There has also been the criticism made about the cost of add-ons. And I think it would be naive of us to ignore that many clinics work in a very competitive um, financial uh, area and that there is pressure on some clinics to maximize profit. And if that's done unethically or without integrity, then patients could have treatments pushed upon them for the financial benefit of the clinic as opposed to the clinical benefit to the patient. And I think of us, all of us need to be exquisitely sensitive to that, to that possibility. Okay. We've tried to look at some of the reasons why clinics offer add-ons. Why do they offer add-ons in the way they do? Most doctors that I speak to that offer add-ons are not 100% convinced that they work. So I think most doctors want to keep them separate to their routine treatment because they accept that these interventions are questionable. And so they want to keep it out of that standard package price. There's a cynical element to this as well. When patients are searching for IVF clinics, one of the parameters that they'll sometimes look at is the cost of a cycle. And the headline cost of IVF is often very similar in most clinics. And the profits are made on the add-ons. So you can go to some clinics um, very close to where I work, where you'll see the baseline price of IVF is 4,000 pounds. 
but the average cost of somebody having a cycle can be £12,000 once you've finished putting all the add-ons on. So don't underestimate the cost of add-ons. Many people will say, well, you know, these things are new, they're unproven. Really, the clinic should not be charging for them. Um, and, and within the NHS, there are some add-ons that are offered at no extra cost. In private clinics, they don't usually have the luxury of that. And so because the add-ons do cost money, that price is passed on to the patient. But my advice strongly is to understand the cost of add-ons as a fundamental part of the decision making about whether you should use them. And the reason for that is you may be faced, for example, using a frozen embryo replacement cycle that may cost a thousand pounds. Should you have reproductive immunology or genetic screening at the cost of three thousand pounds or just spend another thousand pounds on another frozen cycle? And there's no doubt if you do a health economic evaluation and we look at, you know, babies born per money spent, you're better just having another frozen cycle. So an understanding of the cost of these things should form a fundamental part of your decision making on whether they're right for you. So doctors are torn about recommending add-ons um, and most doctors will talk about them somewhat without enthusiasm because they understand their controversial place. So why do patients still choose to have add-ons when all of this is now um, you know, in, in the public sector in terms of it being a controversial decision. And I think the reason for that is patients trying to have a baby through assisted conception are just making an enormous investment. And I don't just mean in terms of money, I mean in terms of time, in effort, in logistics. And they want to look back and say, do you know what? I tried everything I possibly could to make my treatment successful. I tried to squeeze out every single percentage point that I could. And I think the problem with a lot of us in 2020 is we have this faith in technology that if there's a procedure, a test or a treatment out there, in particular, if it involves imagery, if it involves um, videos, if it involves laser, gosh, it must work because we know that technology is a good thing. And so we come into this wanting to believe that the add-ons work and the fancier the add-on is, the better. There's the pressure to try something different, which is a theme I keep coming back to. It's an understandable human need. The reality is though, you may not necessarily have to do something different. And again, that has to go into your decision-making. One of the most difficult areas are patients who have a diagnosis of unexplained subfertility. It's much easier to deal with an issue if you understand the fundamental underlying cause. If my fallopian tubes are blocked, I know that that sperm and egg cannot meet up. I know I have to have IVF. If my sperm quality is very poor, I understand that I have to have ICSI to introduce my sperm and my partner's eggs. And the difficulty is when we have no explanation, when we say to people, your scenario is unexplained, we really don't know what's going on. Sometimes that puts additional pressure on people to adopt more technology, to over medicalize a scenario, and to want to choose the entire shopping list of add-ons, because there isn't a fundamental cause that they can identify for their subfertility. My personal feeling is it's probably even simpler than that. Patients tend to trust their doctors. And I think that's usually the right thing because most doctors have their patients' best interests at heart. So I think for you to trust your doctor is a good thing. I think if you're in a scenario where you are concerned about the level of trust and the level of integrity that's in the relationship, and you're questioning things, well, not really questioning, more you have that feeling that something's not right, then it's time to have a new clinical relationship with a new doctor and a new clinic because you need to feel that your doctor is doing everything they possibly can to help you. At the same time, 
Don't let it become a passive paternalistic situation. Do ask questions. Do be sure, doctor, why do you think this is gonna work for me? Are there any risks? Are there any problems? How much is it gonna cost me, doctor? So the questioning is good, but the questioning of the trust and integrity, it may be time to move on. Okay, so we're gonna get different opinions, different doctors are gonna have different views, and you'll speak to friends and colleagues who have been through treatments who may have got pregnant and have ascribed the reason they got pregnant to the adult. And of course, we all want something to work, so we will desperately try and grab onto things. So what is the evidence? Well, I've got a couple of techniques down here to give you a feel for where the evidence lies. Some people say, oh, these are new techniques and there's just no evidence to support them yet. That's actually not the case. I mean, look at embryo glue. Embryo glue in the first two trials was shown to increase live birth rates in patients and decrease ectopic rates. There have been 17 randomized control trials. And when you put all of that data together, the data suggests that embryo glue does improve live birth rate. The problem is that when these trials were designed and performed, they only had moderate quality. So the evidence that's available supports embryo glue, but that evidence is not conclusive enough for us to recommend embryo glue routinely as a way of helping your embryo adhere and stick to your womb lining. Let's talk about DNA fragmentation. It's, it's something that I see brought up in conversation by patients quite frequently. The female in the couple may often say, doctor, why do I have to go through everything? Why are all the tests uh, all about me? What about my husband? Can't we do some more tests for my husband? I've read about sperm DNA fragmentation. Can we do on top of the sperm test? Because sperm tests are really from the 1940s. Isn't there a more modern way of analyzing sperm quality? Well, there are 658 studies looking in to sperm DNA fragmentation and there is insufficient evidence to routinely recommend it. So don't believe in a technology just because it's there. Interestingly, in the work that's been done on DNA fragmentation, it has shown that giving antioxidants when the DNA fragmentation is low can sometimes improve male outcomes. So these are supplements such as um, vitamin E, zinc, selenium. But again, even though that evidence is there, the quality of that evidence is low. So it means the level of belief that we have in the data being correct is also relatively low. What about time lapse? I mean, time lapse is this system where we put your uh, embryo in an incubator and the incubator thinks it's a womb. It's dark, it's perfect temperature, it's perfect humidity. So it's the closest we have as an incubator that's trying to be a female uterus. But not only that, we can take time-lapse imaging and we can watch your embryo grow over five days. And we can use artificial intelligence to look at patterns which tell us which embryos are going to implant to give a healthy baby and which embryos are not going to implant. It is amazing, sexy science that's very seductive. It must work. It's been around for five years and we still have insufficient evidence to routinely recommend it. There is no doubt it helps you run your laboratory better. It is the most excellent control, uh, sorry, it's the most excellent machine for quality control in the lab. But does it help patients get pregnant quicker? The evidence just isn't there at the moment. Genetic screening. This is one of the most controversial areas of add-ons. Um, there are 11 randomized controlled trials which show that pre-implantation genetic testing is a complete waste of time. There are three randomized controlled trials that show benefit. So who should we believe? At the moment, looking at the best evidence available, there is no robust evidence that it improves your live birth rate. And that's kind of understandable if you think about it, because the genetic testing doesn't improve the embryo in any way at all. So whether we put an embryo back that's been genetically tested or one that hasn't, because you haven't improved the embryo in any way, it's unlikely to give you a significant difference in live birth rate. What still needs to be evaluated 
is if it helps you pick the best embryo of a big bunch, could you actually avoid putting back abnormal embryos and therefore could you get pregnant quicker? Because I think all of the couples that come through our, through our door, they want to get pregnant now. And anything that shortens the time might be helpful. And could pre-implantation genetic screening reduce miscarriage? Again, these are questions that remain to be answered. And therefore, pre-implantation genetic should not be something that's offered routinely. Does it have a place for certain patients? Maybe. But we need more evidence to figure that out. Mitochondrial DNA load, I put this in because it's just the hottest, trendiest thing in town. Again, be careful of always being innovative because it doesn't mean it's going to work. This is what assesses the energy of cells um, and can try and differentiate embryonic cells that have a normal energy level. Are the Duracell batteries working perfectly? Uh, or are there abnormalities? And this is currently undergoing a randomized control trial to try and give us some answers. Assisted hatching has been around for a long time. This is where we see embryos have a hard shell. By dissolving some of that shell, could we improve embryos hatching? There are three meta-analyses that have put all of the studies together. Uh, there is a little bit of evidence that it can improve clinical pregnancy rate, but there is no evidence that it improves live birth rate. So this is that BMJ paper. 71% of add-ons have systematic review. 50% have Cochrane review, which are the gold standard of medical analysis. So there is evidence there, it's just not conclusive. Five add-ons did show an improvement in live birth. 13 add-ons had evidence, but it was insufficient. Seven add-ons showed no improvement, and one add-on actually showed a negative effect. And that was pre-implantation genetic testing when performed on day three embryos. Finally, you'll be doing these add-ons because you think it might improve your chance of success. But ask also, is there any risk of harm? Because that's important. And indeed, um, pre-implantation genetic screening of day three embryos can make you discard embryos that could have repaired themselves and could have given you a healthy baby. So always check the downside of looking at these add-ons. Uh, another example would be the use of steroids during a COVID outbreak. So ask your doctor, I'm thinking about this, but really, what's your honest feeling on my risk? There is no doubt there's a financial cost, some of which are very significant. It may be unnecessary. And if it prevents you accessing good evidence-based treatments, I think that actually is doing harm. Perhaps the cruelest thing is false hope. You know, being uh, told that this new add-on is the best thing since sliced bread, getting that emotional investment in the treatment again, when that is false, is cruel and is wrong. Okay, so what are the real issues? What do we need to think about as we finish the talk? Are add-ons good science, but still in an early development with the evidence building? To be slightly more cynical, is it a load of Harley Street witchcraft focused on exploiting vulnerable patients for the financial gain of the clinic? Or is it a little bit more nuanced? Is it procedures that may have a sound underlying scientific hypothesis, but the trials that have been done are just equivocal and doctors cannot give you an honest answer about whether they work or whether they don't. I want to talk about the cheeseburger effect. So this story comes from a colleague of mine who had a patient come along to him who had had five cycles of IVF elsewhere and wanted to try pre-implantation genetic testing. Um, and this doctor was very against the idea of pre-implantation genetic testing. He considered it an add-on with no evidence base. And he said to the patient, as you walk out of my clinic and you look right, you will see a McDonald's. I want you to go in there each time you come and see me and I want you to order a cheeseburger. I don't think there's anything special sauce in the, in the cheeseburger, but it's very tasty and I'd recommend it. The patient went and ate the cheeseburger every time she came in for a visit, came in for treatment, her sixth IVF attempt, and she got pregnant, okay? 
Now, was it the cheeseburger that helped her get pregnant? Now, all of us will immediately say no, okay, because there is no evidence that cheeseburgers help you get pregnant. And I would urge you to think that some of these add-ons are cheeseburgers, okay? You can take them, you can get pregnant as a re in that cycle, but please don't think that having the cheeseburger is what got you pregnant. Sometimes it's just your lucky turn of that good egg meeting that good sperm. So be careful of having faith in issues that are just associated with the treatment, but have no cause of benefit. If you remember one thing from this talk, remember the cheeseburger effect. Okay, so is there a sensible way forward? Um, there probably is. I think the medical profession needs to understand that not every trial or not every uh, procedure is gonna have a prospective randomized control trial that are always gonna give us the answers. Many of these add-ons have prospective randomized control trials and we don't have definitive answers. Should we think about things differently? Can we use new tools such as bioinformatics, big data? If we looked at all the cycles on the HFEA database, more than 400,000 cycles, and we knew who had add-ons and who didn't, that would be very powerful in us learning which add-ons have benefit and which ones are a waste of time. I think we need to have an honest discussion about what level of evidence is acceptable. Because I think human nature might be, if there's a little bit of evidence that's available, do you know what? Let's go with that. So I think we have to understand that different levels might be acceptable. How do we feel about putting the ball in the patient's court by saying to each patient who comes through the door, here's the evidence, why don't you decide? Okay. My personal perspective on that is I think you should involve patients in a conversation about their care and it should be joint decision making. But I also think that the professional has an obligation to give their professional advice about what it is um, that may help the patient best. So I don't think we as professionals can completely abdicate. What we have to be really careful of is by mentioning a treatment is available, will our patients see that as an endorsement of the treatment? So we've got to keep our conversations honest and we've got to keep them clear. Uh, all of these fertility uh, societies got together following the BMJ paper and they really felt that there was a responsible way forward in terms of the treatment of add-ons uh, and how to behave in an innovative but responsible way. You've got to be honest if there's lack of conclusive evidence, understand that patients have strong views that have enormous value. Be careful of what's on your website. It's much easier for me during a 30 minute conversation to explain the subtleties and nuances of embryo glue. It's more difficult if I have a headline on my, wife's, on my website saying embryo glue does it exactly what it says on the tin. So be careful of website messages. We need a culture change, but most of all, we need that conversation to be open and honest. And these are some of the principles that clinics can use in innovating, bringing in new things, but at the same time, always keeping the patient's best interests at the heart of any conversation. This is the regulator's view on this. Uh, this is the traffic light system introduced by the HFPA. Very simple. If there's no evidence that a add-on improves the life birth rate, or if there's potential evidence of harm, red traffic light, stop. Don't necessarily not do it, but stop, think, talk to your doctor. An amber light, maybe there's a little bit of evidence that this could help, not for everybody. Is it right for me, doctor? And then finally, green, there's at least one good quality randomized control trial showing an improved life birth rate and it's safe. So this is the state of um, the HFA website last night. And the reason it's important to look last night is that it, this change is all the time. And the big change recently has been pre-implantation genetic screening has moved from orange for amber to red. Very controversial. A lot of people in the field disagree, uh, but clearly there's an element of opinion on the strength of evidence behind all of these things. And I would strongly recommend that you use this as a guide. If you have a doctor recommending an add-on that is a red traffic light, say to that doctor, 
hang on. I've just come off the HFEA website. It's a red traffic light. Talk me through why you think this is right for me. And I think that additional conversation will help you make an informed decision that's right for you. So in conclusion, I think that all of us in the professional side of the field, regulators, academics, and clinicians, we have a role at contributing to the evidence base to help all of us make the best decisions for our patients. It is the ethical duty of your medical professional to help you and to do no harm. And what we have to do is recognize that you are an important part of the decision making, that we need to respect your informed choice and we need to respect your patient autonomy. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Stuart. That was really great and really informative. Um, and we have some questions. Um, if you're happy for me to start. Yes, um, please. And we can go through some of those. Um, so our, our first question um, is, I am 43 and looking to start frozen embryo transfer. I am confused whether to do natural, natural or medicated FET. My monthly cycle is regular and I am inclined towards doing a natural round. What would you suggest? So that's not an easy question to answer because both options are reasonable. Uh, the best available evidence in this comes from a trial in Oxford where they randomized people to have natural cycle and others to have medicated uh, and it was completely randomized. And when they came down and analyzed the results, the results were identical. And so therefore you need to use other softer measures. For example, some people will say, I don't really like taking all this medication, steer them towards natural, towards natural cycle. Other people will say, do you know what? I have a really busy life. I've got a busy job. I've got childcare undergoing natural cycle. I have no schedulability or no prediction because my ovaries are setting the timetable. For me, it's far better to know that I have a scheduled time when my endometrium is optimized. I would like to have a medicated cycle. So really the answer is both are on the table. Both will work as well as the other. Look at the softer angles to help you make that decision. Thank you. Um, and our next, next one is, what's your opinion on IMSI for someone suffering from high sperm DNA fragmentation? Okay, so uh, I have to declare a conflict of interest here. When IMSI came out, I thought it was a great idea. I love innovation. I was an early adopter and I spent 15,000 pounds buying the IMSI camera for the clinic. And it's now sat in a corner and we never use it anymore. Um, IMSI was a great idea um, that seemed to help us identify the best sperm when there were so few sperm around. But unfortunately, or fortunately, there have now been really good trials of IMSI done uh, and the results have not lived up to expectations. So there isn't really any evidence now that IMSI brings something additional to the table. Um, there would be one exception to that and that would be in somebody who had failed fertilization following ICSI. In those patients, I would consider IMSI, but that would be pretty much it. Thank you. Um, and our next one is, I've heard the AMA Alice test can be helpful in frozen angle transfer if you've had multiple miscarriages. Does this mean you should always favour frozen and AMA Alice before transfer in cases of repeated implantation? Okay, so that's a great question. You are right. Sorry, implantation failure. Yeah, so this is a great question because you are right on the cutting edge of implantation research, looking at the genetic expression of the wound lining cells. The first thing to say is that the use of implantation testing such as Emma, Alice, Era, there are several on the market, does not help you differentiate whether fresh or frozen is best for you. What it helps differentiate is if you're having frozen, what protocol and what timetable of uh, uh, implantation should you have. So essentially what these things look at is how much progesterone makes your individual womb lining become its most receptive. At the moment, 
we treat all women exactly the same. We say all women will have a receptive endometrium after 120 hours of progesterone. But could women be different? And could they have an individualized implantation potential that these tests will take out? So instead of getting 120 hours, one patient might need 110 hours, another patient might need 140 hours. So it individualizes the implantation window. I think this has huge potential. There is a great underlying scientific hypothesis, but there isn't enough evidence available yet to recommend it. But the trial has been done. And so I very much hope that we will have an answer about whether these things are useful, probably within the next six months. So it's like all add-ons, great underlying scientific hypothesis waiting for the conclusive evidence so we can potentially apply it for everybody. So I, I don't know whether you want to hang on six months to get the answer or, or to press on. Um, so, but it, it, has, it has enormous potential waiting for that evidence base. Thank you. So our next one is, I have had two miscarriages. The most recent pregnancy ending at 14 weeks. This year was a 5AA non-PGS tested embryo. The embryo was made when I was 31, so I was surprised the embryo was genetically abnormal. My first embryo was also a good grade. Um, I am booked to have egg collection tomorrow in an attempt to get more and better quality embryos. What matters more, the grading or if an embryo is genetically normal? Okay, so they're both important, but genetic normality, so if you get a euploid embryo, that's a much more trustworthy, accurate answer than just looking at an embryo. When you're looking at an embryo, you are basically deciding how pretty is it? Has it developed normally? But what you really want to know is what's going on inside that embryo, what's happening with the genes and the chromosomes. So if you had a choice, if you had one embryo that was a 5A star embryo and another embryo that wasn't as pretty but was diagnosed as euploid, definitely go for the euploid embryo, no question about it. The difficulty we have is there's also more to embryo implantation than just euploid. So there are other things that are going on with an embryo which will determine embryonic health, not just the chromosomes. And that's why most laboratories that believe in genetic testing actually do both. They look at morphology and they look at the genetic result. But the genetic result would usually trump the embryo uh, morphology. Getting an abnormal embryo at 31 is common. Okay, at age 31, probably 50% of all of your embryos are abnormal. And that's normal. There's something about us as a species that we create lots of abnormal eggs. Other species don't seem to do it. There must be some strange Darwinian advantage to us producing so many abnormal eggs. But boy, does it make IVF tougher and less likely to be successful. Thank you. And when you say the evidence is low quality, what do you mean? So um, let's say I do a trial on uh, embryo glue, okay? Um, and I give half the patients glue and I give half the patients no glue. Now, if I have a thousand patients, my result is probably gonna be reliable. But if I do that study in 10 patients, and even if it shows overwhelmingly that embryo glue works, if I'm only testing 10 patients, that study is weak and has low data quality. So the design of these studies, the number of people that are involved, how the results are analyzed, determine the quality of the data, not just the answer. You've got to have the quality behind the answer to make you believe. Otherwise, it might have just been chance. Thank you. And is assisted hatching the same as egg artificial activ activation? No, no, they're very different. Assisted hatching is something that's done with a laser or a chemical to the zona or shell of the embryo to make a small hole. Now embryos will naturally make that hole as they land in the uterus and the cells come out of the shell to allow the embryo to latch on and implant in the uterus. Many people believe that in IVF, or particularly when you freeze an embryo, that the zona becomes extra hard and therefore assisting with hatching can improve outcome. The evidence probably doesn't support that. Egg activation is a newer concept. 
which comes from studies on, on butterfly eggs, believe it or not, where the use of calcium makes the egg sensitive to fertilization. And so we, we now put eggs in calcium rich media to activate them, to make them able to be fertilized by a sperm. Great idea, good underlying scientific hypothesis, hardly any data to support that it's a good idea. Thank you. And we have another one that a lot of people um, ask, an inspiration or frozen base? Ah, okay. Well, if I could give you the answer today, I, I think I'd probably win a Nobel Prize tomorrow because the honest answer is we don't know yet. Okay. I think probably the best we can come out with is frozen and fresh are at least as good as each other. Okay. That's probably the strongest we can get at the moment. The data to say that frozen is best is not there yet, but many recent studies are leaning towards frozen. Um, and there are some advantages in that it's much safer to do frozen because it massively reduces the risk of hyperstimulation. And if there are any patients out there that are producing 30 eggs or feeling unwell, my strong advice is that it's gonna be better for you to segment your treatment and have a elective frozen freeze all rather than have a fresh. But it's more difficult if we think about normal responding patients or even more difficult if we think about poor responding patients. There is no doubt that if you do freeze all, it'll take you longer to get pregnant. But safety wise frozen, but overall, which is best? We just gotta wait for more trials to report. Thank you. And we've got time just for a couple more. Um, would you recommend only going for additional treatments only if a first IVF round doesn't work? Yeah, I think that's probably quite a sound principle. Okay. And I think most doctors actually operate that way. If in, so your first chance of getting pregnant is in your first cycle. It has the highest chance of success. And it's quite rare to recommend add-ons. So unless there was something very specific in your history or something quite unusual, certainly in my own personal practice, it's very, very unusual for me to recommend any form of add-on in your first cycle. Um, and so as a, I think stick with the evidence-based stuff, I think would be my advice. Okay. Um, I recently had my first failed cycle, 26. Husband has low motility and sperm count, but has enough for ICSI. I have a MH of 29 and a half. I had 12 eggs collected, only four were mature, none fertilized. Clinic has advised egg artificial activation. Is it worth going ahead with this? I think I'd want to know a little bit more information from your doctor about why they think egg activation is going to solve that problem because there's lots of other things that can affect egg maturity and therefore improve fertilization rates as well. Um, and there's a lot more things that are proven in terms of manipulation of the HCG trigger, dual triggers with uh, an agonist, leaving you one extra day sometimes. So I'm not sure if egg activation would be my next step so I think that's worth a further conversation. The evidence behind egg activation is poor. I, I, think, I think I'd really want my doctor to convince me um, why. And so I, I would be a little bit cautious with that. Okay, and my wife has had two early miscarriages out of three transfers. At 37, is the genetics of the embryos most likely reason should we look at genetic testing next cycle? Okay, so that's a slightly complicated answer. Um, early miscarriages in everybody, whatever age you are, are usually genetic problem within the embryo, okay? It's just more frequent the older we get. And certainly at 37, that chance of having a miscarriage as a, as a result of genetically abnormal embryo is gonna be higher. But actually, having genetic screening 
the evidence so far for patients with recurrent miscarriage is it doesn't seem to improve your chance of having a healthy baby again compared to just going out and trying naturally for six months. Now, I've had many patients who said, you know what, doctor, I've had two miscarriages. I don't want to go out and try naturally for another six months and go through the pain of another miscarriage. So actually, I want to do the genetic screening. And those centers that believe in genetic testing, they are doing genetic testing more for patients with recurrent miscarriage. Um, the data on if you've had three consecutive miscarriages is beginning to look interesting. After two early miscarriages, it's more difficult to say. So I don't think you would be wrong to do genetic testing next time, um, but I don't think I would recommend it routinely. It depends a little bit how many embryos you get. You know, if you're only getting two or three embryos, nature's already telling you these are the best embryos available. If you're faced with getting 10 embryos, could genetic screening help you pick the best one first? Possibly. So I, I think that is a conversation that's worth having with your doctor. Thank you. Um, and any questions that have been unanswered because there are many, um, please either resubmit them to myself or we will answer them, try and answer them over the course of the next week or so. Um, one of the other questions that we were asked, which I'm just about to answer, is that the webinar will be available on the website over the next week or so. Um, I would just like to say thank you to Stuart for joining us um, and giving a fantastic presentation. And unless there is anything else you would like to add, Stuart, at this point? No, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to chat to everybody and I'm really grateful for everybody giving their time. Um, and I believe you're back possibly in a few weeks to give a different I, yeah, presentation. Yeah, talk in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, which is fantastic. So I'd it. just like to say thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight and goodbye for now.